All right. So today we have Yishai Carmiel, my good friend, CEO of Meaning, a speech synthesis startup with the tagline Augmenting uh, the Voice Communication Experience. But today we'll be discussing recent developments in AI and generative AI as it generally pertains to audio data. And full disclosure, I am an advisor to Meaning. So Yishai, welcome back to the Data Exchange Podcast. Great, great to speak with you, Ben. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me over here. All right. So topic number one, uh, generating audio. So I guess this would be generally generative AI for speech. So there's two uh, general forms here. There's text in, so input text and you get audio out, or you input audio and you get also audio out. So let's go first with the text in audio out so yishai i'm very i am a very avid user of text to speech tools so this is the classic uh hear some text uh read it for me uh, uh have a computer read it for you and my general impression is th these tools are getting better um maybe not to the point where you would fire all voice actors but what what's your general uh, uh, overview for our listeners about text-to-speech. No, so they are getting much, much better, actually. And if you are thinking about it, the amount of progress that we are seeing in the past two years, for example, is enormous. And there are still some challenges, of course. And if you are thinking about you know, firing all voice actors, I think it's not it's not going to be the case even with cutting edge AI. It's just going to be helping shorten the development process in terms of voice actors. Because let me give you some kind of example, and let's take gaming, for example. Okay, creating a game, the audio production of creating a game, it's a huge cumbersome and a huge amount of effort. And sometimes I need to add another production unit. Sometimes um, I need to add another thing that I didn't think about upfront. So bringing a voice actor into the production studio, doing the whole process over and over again, it's a very complicated process. So these generative AI voices that can use text to speech and maybe synthesizing the voice actor voice, that's going to be something that is very helpful. And we actually see a lot of use cases in the gaming industry. So that's one aspect. Another aspect, for example, is what we call multilingual. Let's say that I'm developing a game. So I have the voice actor. He's a native English. He was born and raised in the US. But now I want to use the same voice in Japanese or in Korean. Can I just use the voice timbre and make just the voice actor speak Japanese? So that's another interesting use case. And this is what we call multilingual text-to-speech, which is also gaining a lot of attention right now. So is uh, multilingual text-to-speech real uh, in terms of uh, practical and available in real time? In real time, so here's the thing. A lot of the use cases are not needed for real time because it's what we call post-production. But this thing is very real. So for example, if the audience is interested, recently Meta introduced a, a model that is called Voicebox. And Voicebox, one of the things that you can see, and they are giving a few examples, is literally these type of use cases that you have, for example, a, a voice actor or a speaker that is speaking in English and you want to do something or translation in Spanish. So you can see and you hear the same sentence exactly in Spanish with the voice of the voice actor, which is pretty impressive. And it sounds very, very natural. So Yishai, for uh, those of us who don't follow speech closely, uh, give us a sense of, so in the large language model space, right? So someone publishes something, uh, generally there's a lot of excitement and then there's someone who will kind of try to implement it in open source. So from the time someone publishes an idea, if it's exciting enough, if it's interesting enough, maybe in a matter of weeks, uh, developers can start using it. So in speech, when you see something published as a paper, how what's the time lag between that and being uh, something that people start actually using? It really depends. Sometimes it really depends on the on the type of model, on the complication, if it's, it took a lot of time to train it. Sometimes it can take days, 
if the if it's some kind of a, what we call we have a model that is pre-trained and we need just need to do fine tuning. And if sometimes the model is very complicated, for example, some of the models that Meta are releasing are models that needs to be trained for weeks or even months of hundreds of GPUs. Releasing that to the open source, it's a little bit more challenging than the classical than the, what I wouldn't call classical, but the LLMs, the development of the LLMs. So sometimes it can take days, sometimes it can take weeks, and sometimes it can take. But they can. Months. What if they release like the model? Here's the model with the weights. So so yes. So a lot of the things. So one of the things that we are seeing is that you know they are releasing the model with the weights, and the license is pretty um, good, you know, to use. So a lot of the things that are related to fine tuning, uh, it's easier to adapt and easier to use. So this is these are some of the things that we are seeing. Uh, we won't see, for example, like very, very complicated models being retrained from the scratch because, again, like the open source community sometimes cannot afford these type of very large scale trainings. So next, uh, next item in the audio or generative AI space is text to music. So is this science fiction? So in other words, uh, for our listeners, this is the equivalent of like, uh, I guess, a DALI 2 or stable diffusion where you describe something and you describe a picture. In this case, you describe a, a melody or a piece of music and then you some uh, model generates it for you. Is this science fiction at this point? No, no, it's definitely not science fiction. For example, I think that Google released, Google AI released a model that is called, if I remember correctly, Audio LM. A music LM, and these things are very real, and you can see some examples. The key thing that I'm thinking is that when are you going to see practical applications? It's not going to be like you know in, in a few years. It's going to be in the next six to twelve months. These models are becoming more and more realistic, and as you probably see with the development of LLMs, these things are moving in a very very rapid uh, uh, pace. So we are going we are going to see a lot of interesting models and actually a lot of interesting applications. And again, if you're thinking about it, generating music, not just for creators, but for example, for commercials or um, for other use cases, this is something that is going to be very interesting. Or for, for example, for this podcast, I have music at the beginning and at the end. So presumably oh, I, yeah. can, I can generate that in the future. All right. So the next type of audio generation is audio in, audio out. And this seems like in your sweet spot. So speech synthesis falls into this. So uh, what what are what are the latest developments in this space? So basically, this is what we call speech to speech. And in terms of one of in terms of what we call generative AI for voice, this is one of the hardest trends right now. So basically, you have audio in and you have audio out. And in real if time. You're thinking, in, in real. It, it can be real time. It doesn't have to be real time, but some of the interesting use cases, of course, are in real time, and this is what we are doing. Um, and there are a lot of use cases for that. Uh, think that um, I want to transform my voice. So there are like multiple aspects. There is something that is called voice conversion. That is something that can be called voice and accent conversion or voice and speaker conversion. So there are a lot of things. And some of the other aspects that are related to that are translations, for example. And recently, Meta also released a very interesting open source related to translation. Basically, I'm speaking, and at the same time, it generates an output voice, translating my voice into another language. And one of the things that is happening and people saw is that in translation, sometimes the classical methodology was taking my voice, transcribing it, meaning doing some kind of a speech recognition, doing a text translation, and then synthesizing it, now, and again, when I'm saying now, so, it's, so, so it's a pipeline. It's a pipeline. But now one of the things that people are seeing is applying speech to speech, meaning applying generative LLMs based directly on the speech gives better performance. So this is what we call speech to speech. So that's that's something that is, is becoming very interesting. Uh, that, what, the, what you just described can't be done in real time, I imagine. It, so here's the thing. It really depends how you define real time. Like real time, like 100 milliseconds latency, it cannot be done just for the fact that, you know, sometimes the words, when I'm doing translations, the words are different. Or just the, LL, the LLMs are slow. 
Yeah, yes, the LLMs are slow, but again, like you know, yeah. this is something that you know that is going to be solvable, but it can be very close to real time. Meaning that I'm saying a sentence, and, and once I'm speaking, ending, you know, once I'm ending the sentence, the output could be very, very close to real time. So the limitations is not because of the it's not because of the model; it's because of how people are speaking. So what you described is an. One of the topics I wanted to talk about, which is speech translation, is that correct? Yes, speech translation. And, and as you described, the uh, in the past, the typical pipeline is take the speech, convert it to text, take that text to machine translation, and then the translated text you pass it through, uh, basically text to speech, right? So that's still, for the most part, you would describe Yishai the the most normal way people tackle this problem? So yeah, so that was the, what we call, again, classic classical methodology until, I think, 12 to 18 months. And again, and don't put me on the spot on that, but one of the things that is happening right now is that I can apply LLMs or what we call the voice LLMs directly on the speech itself. And one of the things that I can, I, there are like there are two methodologies. One we called is take my voice, for example, in English, and create an output, for example, of text output in French. Okay, and this is what we call speech to text, and the, the translation that is giving a text. And the other aspect is that you know create another translation or another speech, an output of speech in, in French. So this is a, this is what we call direct S to S. Um, again, so you, skip, is, you basically what you describe, you skip one of the steps of the classic pipeline. Yeah, what we call we do, you don't go through the word space in yeah. in some extent. You're going you know, directly on the, on the directly on the speech space, and and the interesting things again, like you know, if you are looking at translation, you have some some kind of a matrix input input language versus output language, and it's some kind of a some kind of a m by n matrix. So, for example, um, Meta released a very interesting model. Like I think, like right now, we're recording the podcast. Like, in, like a few weeks ago, even two weeks ago, that is what we call multimodal. Basically, it supports. I think that you know, in the input, a uh, one hundred one hundred different languages. If you want to do speech and translate it into text, and if you are talking about direct speech to speech, it supports thirty five different languages. Uh, so that's that's pretty amazing. And, and we see that. So this, uh, uh, so this release, would you describe that as real time? So again, I think that again, based on what I've seen, it's not really, it's not real time. They are not, you know, specific, you know, specifically. But I think that the real time aspect of that is more of an engineering effort rather than a modeling effort. So even if again, like the model, you know, is not going to be real time at this stage. Developers can take the model and take the data set that they released and take it into another level of very close to real time. All right. So the the next aspect is uh, the models that use audio inputs. Of course, the classic example here is automatic speech recognition. So you take speech, convert it to text. That seems to be have become a real commodity with Whisper. And I don't know Definitely. if. Uh, I shared this with you, but uh, my friend Pete Warden and his startup Useful Sensors now have uh, an ASR system that you can run on a basically a $50 board on the edge. Uh, I saw it uh, demoed, uh, Pete demoed it for me in a very loud, noisy uh, coffee shop, and it was doing it, I wouldn't say, you know, like milliseconds, but few second delay so enough so that you can imagine in the future uh if you are someone with a uh, hearing disability you can take one of Pete's things wear it around your neck uh and then you you have a screen and you can you can understand what people are saying even in crowded spaces so $50 board so they have all sorts of special tools they wrote their own framework they compiled it for the for the this particular uh uh, hardware and so on and so forth, but obviously open AI whisper. So what else is going on in automatic speech recognition? And would you say this is an area where, uh, developers can just start hacking and building things on top of they these can models? Yeah. So whisper, the release of whisper 
I would say that from someone who's been working in the speech recognition for more than 15 years, the release of Whisper really creates some kind of a commodity of speech recognition. Because up until now, speech recognition was working pretty well. It has it, it had its challenges, of course. But now taking Whisper, releasing it into an open source, it was trained, I think, to run almost close to 700,000 hours. And what we, it's what we call multilingual, so it supports multiple languages. That opens the door for a lot of developers just to take this and just run it out of the box and it's working. Okay, well, like, is it like, you know, literally you can build the best speech recognition on the world specific custom made to your needs? Maybe not. It's very close to that. But it opens the door to a lot of developers doing that. One of the things that uh, Whisper is lacking right now, and again, I think that there are a lot of uh, things that are taking it to the next step, is real time. And also inference optimizations. And there are a few people who took Whisper and convert it into, for example, C++ code. So it's running all the inference yeah, much, much faster. Whisper CPP, yeah. Yes, yeah. Whisper CPP. And there is something that is called Whisper Jacks, for example. And, and these things, again, like, you know, they are very efficient, working extremely well. And, and the interesting thing is that it supports not just English, but other languages as well. So it really so, so Yisha, in, in this space of ASR, is it only Whisper or other research groups like Google and Meta? Are they also releasing things in this area? So, of course, so here's the thing. With, I think that with English... Again, like, so if you're thinking about speech recognition, like, it's, there are, like, multiple challenges. As you said, for example, like, if you are, like, not trying to do transcription in a very noisy environment, there are going to be challenges, okay? But let's say that, for example, for English, you know, the, you know, the things are very, very well established, and you have a lot of solutions for that. So solving speech recognition in, like, very challenging environments, it's always going to be a problem. Also, for example, like, if I'm speaking in English, like, I have pretty thick accent. And sometimes this is also going to be a challenge. But the second challenge is that how can I scale speech recognition into a lot of languages? Okay, if you are thinking about it right now, if you are going into Google Cloud, I think that there support 120 languages, but basically in the world you have around 7,000 spoken languages. And sometimes even people, for example, I know a lot of non-native people are just, you know, when they're having a conversation, they are switching between three different channels, you know, languages, for example. So the challenges are how we can support what we call multilingual speech recognition in very challenging environments. And actually Google um, released a very interesting model that was trained, I think, on 12 million hours of data that supports one model that supports 100 different languages. And this is, if you're thinking about it, also another challenge with speech recognition, how can I encapsulate one model that supports multiple languages? I don't want, for example, to generate 100 to 1,000 different models. I just want one gigantic big model that supports all of these languages. And this is one of the things that are happening right now with speech in general, consolidations of all the languages into one model. Interesting. So are, are there other aspects of, uh, of this kind of uh, uh, use case where the model Models input is audio. So we talked about audio in, text out. Are are there other uh, people experimenting with audio in, something else out? I don't know what something oh. else would be. So so here's the thing. If you're thinking, yeah. let's take, take text-to-speech, for example. And this is one of the most uh, well-known problems with text-to-speech. I can create a specific user text-to-speech, like collecting, for example, a few hundreds of hours or tens of, tens of hours and create a very high quality text to speech. But now, for example, I want to customize the text to speech into another person's voice. Okay, let's say that I want to generate the text to speech with your voice. So sometimes uh, one of the inputs to this text to speech is going to be audio. For example, I'm inserting your audio, the system learns your voice profile. And then it can generate some kind of a text to speech with you with your voice. This is what we call sometimes people are calling it voice cloning. Um, sometimes I'm also like adding some kind of a, just a recording without transcription, without anything. So this is some of the inputs audio that are happening for some of these things. And again, like you know, I want to generate either an audio output or some kind of a, a like emotional output of your voice. So there are a lot of aspects of that as well. 
So speaking of which, next topic is speech emotion recognition. Now, uh, my impression is in the in the computer vision space of the speed uh, emotion recognition using faces, it's mostly been debunked and kind of uh, the science is questionable kind of thing because uh, they were using uh, uh, things in uh, in psychology that were questionable in terms of you know uh, facial facial regions and whatever. I don't know the details, but uh, I think a lot of people question the science. So as far as speech, emotion, recognition, uh, where are we? And is it on solid ground? Well, you're, you're spot on. So here's the thing. Even for us as humans, again, I'm speaking for myself. Sometimes yeah. when someone is speaking, it's hard for me to read what are their emotional state. Um, also, if you're thinking about it, um, we as humans have a tendency, to, for example, to um, identify sarcasm. Let me give you an example. Are you satisfied with the service? Yes, of course, I'm satisfied with the service. So again, like, you know, if you're looking at the transcription or if you're looking about, you know, some of the information, it seems that you are satisfied, but a human being would understand that you're being sarcastic. So one of the things that is happening right now, I think that, again, I, I agree with you that it's a little bit in, 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 in no man's land right now. Again, like, you know, if, if you're asking, comparing to actually comparing to the other stuff, some of the things that are happening right now, trying to do some kind of a multimodality using voice and vision and maybe other aspects to get more information. So people are collecting more data and using more advanced models. But it's a little bit, I think, you know, um, not as advanced uh, as the other things that are happening in speech and, of course, in, in other aspects. So uh, when we talk about Automatic speech recognition, you you mentioned that Whisper used hundreds of thousands of hours of data, and then Google's latest model used millions of hours of data. So another interesting topic that I wanted to talk about is restoration, uh, which is more around data. So turning degraded audio signals into high quality, high quality ones. So apparently there's a cottage industry of models around restoration. So can you tell us uh, what's going on there and why it's important? Yeah. So first of all, Google released a model that is called M M M M I I fur, which is knows how to do restorations. And here's the thing. Think about that. One of the things that is happening when you're using huge amount of data is that it's very, you, you cannot do supervision of the data. You can do, you can maybe do weak supervision, and a lot of the things that even we are seeing is that when we are collecting data is that sometimes the data quality is not good enough. I don't know, for example, I'm I'm creating some kind of an open source recording a lot of people voices and there is a dog barking in the background and some, someone recorded you know, their voice in a very public you know, noisy environment. So some of the things that, and again, one of the things that we're seeing is that you know the model quality is really correlated with the quality of data. So if we can create models that just enhance the quality of the data, this can create a huge, huge benefit. And one of the things, for example, with them, that we saw is that there is a very well-known data set uh, for generating text-to-speech, which is called Libra TTS. The quality of some of their voices over there was, you know, you know, was not that great. And again, we are talking about thousands and thousands of hours. Google released, based on this project, a new, new, a new data set, which is called Libra TTSR, which is restorations, which the audio quality is much, much better. And that means that you can generate much better models with the higher quality because the data quality is good. And as you probably know, um, every type of model is as good as the, as the type of data that you are injecting into this type of model. So that is why maybe it seems like less of an interesting aspect because again, we're talking about you know, data management and data quality, but for someone who is developing models, it's super, super important aspects of that so it seems like uh, uh one thing that's uh, uh coming across as we talk is uh there's some kind of convergence between how we do speech and nlp in the following sense you shy so in the past uh, speech i perceive speech as so hard that i would never go into speech and if i did go into speech i would just use some off-the-shelf model 
that you built or someone, some other group built, right? So and I'm just a user. I mean, NLP to some extent is becoming like that, right? So before, right? So we would have our own favorite NLP library with maybe build our own models and things like this. But now we're all just kind of, uh, now I'm at the point where, okay, so if I can use an LLM to do this task, uh, I would I would do that first. And increasingly more and more of those tasks I can do with LLM. So it seems like uh, now that people have gotten used to shy to, right? So doing NLP, relying on APIs or some external model that they fine tune or augment with a vector database, whatever, they would be more comfortable going into speech now because uh, they'll be more comfortable using uh, a pre-trained model. So what do you think? Without without a doubt. So here's the thing. First of all, without a doubt, because first of all, one of the things that we also see with LLMs and, and especially with speech, and by the way, like a lot of their cutting edge speech-based models are also based on some kind of what we call LLMs for speech, that you are taking some speech parts and create some kind of an LLM on top of that. And doing these things from scratch, a lot of the, a lot of the time doesn't make any sense because the training, the data, you know, the think about the startup, you know, startup company. We non-startup startup company can collect 12 million hours. It's a huge, huge amount of effort. So a lot of the times, you know, we are taking something like a pre-trained model that was trained on thousands of hours or thousands of GPUs and just fine-tune it based on the things. And again, one of also the things that we're seeing is that the open source community, especially you know, things that are coming from the big companies like Meta or Google or even Microsoft. They are becoming with the more permittable license that you can use some of these models. So this is what we are seeing. I think that you know some of the things that we are going to see for small companies is vertical use cases, and maybe domain specific adaptation for some of the use cases, and maybe some um, like your friend Pete taking these things and converting them into a fifty dollar board or making sure that it's working on real time and things like that. So this is what we are going to see. But the foundational models, I think that it's going to be more common, more using APIs. So, so in the NLP or in the tech side, Yishai, it seems like there's an emerging set of uh, practices. So, so first of all, I think uh, as you're alluding to, both NLP and speech, people will uh, realize they need custom models, right? So for whatever reason, for their domain, for their use case, for their application. And so on the LLM side, there's an emerging set of techniques around domain specific model refinement. You mentioned fine tuning. Uh, there's reinforcement learning from human feedback, which is a little more advanced, but uh, the more common route for most people is just Retrieval assisted generation, retrieval augmented generation, right? So using a vector database or a knowledge graph um, to supplement to supplement your pre-trained model. So is there the equivalent of that in speech? Is there the equivalent of RAG in speech? I can't imagine. I guess you can go to a vector database just like you would in NLP and then turn the results from a vector database into voice. I don't know. I'm just making this up. So, so it's how beyond fine tuning. What are the other things that people typically do in speech in order to build custom models? So, again, like you no know, one of the things again. And now, if I'm not talking about specific methodologies, again, there might be similarities. I think that at least for speech, one of the things that we are seeing is that sometimes you need to train on different environments. Okay, which it's again, it's a little bit different from text because when I'm writing, for example, when I'm when I'm writing a text, it do, I, it doesn't matter if I'm writing it within within in a bar or while I'm driving, like you no, know, while I'm like in you know, a very noisy environment because it's still text. But with speech, again, you have all these environments and all these noise that is coming into into play, which definitely affects the model. Sometimes, um, like people talk differently. Again, like you know, the word hello. In text is the same thing, but when people with different accents are saying that it's it sounds different sometimes the model. So again, the fine tuning is a little bit different, I see. Um, and the, and the and the use cases are a little, little bit different than what we are thinking about text. But um, some some of the things are they have some similarities. 
So another topic I wanted to uh, briefly cover is uh, diarization which is uh, dividing a piece of audio into segments based on the identity of the speaker. So I guess, you know, classically called, maybe some people will call this speaker recognition or speaker identification. So anything new happening in the space? So I know that uh, when when Pete gave me the demo for useful sensors ASR on that $50 board, uh, it was just transcribing. They were still going to implement diarization uh later on. So any any new developments there that make it easier and more accessible? So again, like speaker diarization, um, it's a very classical problem. Because think about it, let, let's let's say that um, you and I are like you know in, in a room and there is a single microphone. So basically, we are getting a single channel, and we have both of our voices into a single microphone. So the aim is that can we separate it into two different channels? Ben is speaking, and Isha is speaking, and like you know, we can separate that. So of course, it has its it, its um, challenges. If the environment is noisy, for example, if you know the difference of speaking, there is an overlap. The thing that is happening right now, like, is there some kind of a breakthrough? I think that you know one of the things that is happening is that incorporating all of the latest and greatest techniques of diffusion-based models into speech, using all of the different type of you know very large language model for speech, these things just improve the improve the quality of of these systems. So that's what what we're seeing. Again, like you know, you have these classical data sets, and we're just seeing that you know, injecting all of these new cutting edge techniques using uh, audio LLMs and like diffusion based models pretty improve the quality. So that's what, what I can say. Also, like the more that you're thinking about it, there are more challenging things that you know that you can that you can think about. Like if for example, like two or three years ago in a very noisy environment, the quality of diarizations was really poor. Now we can with all of the latest and great X techniques, we can get much better quality um, for these things. And so, yeah. So actually, one of the things you said earlier uh, struck me, which is at some point you said, okay, so uh, that's not a modeling problem. That's an implementation and engineering problem, which uh, uh, I think uh, uh, for you folks in speech, you kind of take for granted because you have years of experience doing exactly this, right? So taking a model and uh, and doing what you need to do uh whatever it is quantization compression distillation uh graph lowering whatever tricks you need to do in order to make that work in production in a real world environment real time and i think a uh, uh on the llm side we're still in the early days right so we're still kind of uh still enamored by the models and we're still tolerating very very low latency maybe unstable uh, web services and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, I guess I just wanted to kind of uh, uh, share to our listeners that I think a lot of the things that the speech and computer vision community have learned to do will probably start seeing in LLMs too. What do you think, Isha? I 100% agree. I think that also like, you know, if we're like going into specific details, um, again, I can I can talk you know on, on speech and um, real time. It has its challenges because you don't have information into the future. So basically, for example, if I want to do for example like something like very real time speech to speech, one of the challenges that I have in opposed to offline is that I don't have the entire recording. And if you're thinking about it, the same thing is going to happen. For example, in text or in, you know in other aspects, is that I can only you know assess things on the past. I think that sometimes maybe in like in NLP, it's a little bit, um, you have a lot of information in the past that you can rely on, for example, like thousands, tens of thousands of talking, but in speech, um, it's a little bit more problematic because again, like when we are dealing with speech, I really don't care what you have been saying like you no know, an hour ago. Like what I care about is like the last five seconds. And if I don't have like you no know, the last, the next two seconds of the information, it can be very, very challenging. So when we are th thinking about real time, of course, you have all the engineering efforts that you, know, you need to optimize, you need to quantize, you need to make sure that it's working streaming, but also sometimes you need to take into consideration that the modeling aspect can be a little bit challenging or sometimes underperforming because you don't have all the information in front of you. 
so that's another challenge. All right. So then uh, I want to close by talking a little bit about uh, the general aspect of risk mitigation. So I guess sometimes people use the umbrella term responsible AI. So this has aspects like ethics, privacy and security, alignment and safety, and of course, societal impacts, right? So job dislocation and things like that. So um, again, uh, let me begin this uh, part of our conversation by mapping this to uh, uh, recent uh, developments in LLMs, right? So LLMs, of course, one of the things people notice early on is hallucination. I don't think that's a problem in speech, right? So, uh, not right? necessarily. Yeah. Not, not necessarily. Yeah, yeah, not necessarily, right? So, um, so what are some of them uh, for you as someone who builds uh, speech-related applications? So, what are the aspects of risk mitigation and responsible AI that are most top of mind to you? I think that the, the, the first the first and foremost is what we call voice cloning. So uh, if you're thinking about it, like in, in the recent, like we talked about text to speech and adapting text to speech into a specific user voice. So one of the biggest challenges was how much of the new uh, user data do we need in order to adapt the system into the new person's voice? So like until like two years ago, it was we needed 30 to 60 minutes. And again, like, you know, to have a person speaking for 30, 60 minutes with high quality data was a little bit challenging. Now, recently with the latest and greatest models, we need between three to five seconds and the quality is, is no. pretty phenomenal. Yeah, three to five seconds. So this is, for example, a model that is called Val-E or Val-E-X and there are other models like that. So that's going to be a major risk. Uh, so obviously uh, 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 implications for, you know, identity theft, Social engineering, social engineering, right? So, with, without uh, a doubt. Dis disinformation. Uh, without so, but a doubt. There, this is the, but there's nothing. There's no way to uh, really mitigate this, right? So, if the model is out there and open source. So there are so so here's the thing: there are ways to mitigate that by putting some very powerful detectors, and detecting if this is a real voice or not. Okay, and, and people in the research community are, are are using that. Okay, and again, there are there are multiple aspects. First of all, there are aspects: is it a cloned voice or not? Is it a synthetic voice or not? The second aspect is that, for example, if I'm you no know, using your voice, Ben, and is it you know I know how Ben in reality sounds like, and I maybe know how Ben synthesized Ben should, should sound like. Can I identify if this is the real Ben or if this is a synthesized Ben? So. There are a lot of aspects of that. And also there are aspects about maybe we can prevent somebody from cloning my voice. Maybe I can create some kind of a watermark or some kind of information that can help people prevent, you know, preventing from cloning my voice. Because again, this is going to be a risk. Think about it like, like your voice and my voice are available and, and people can just on, download on, on this On this podcast. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and think about, again, like, you know, think about this. This is a major risk. And again, like, you know, and, and again, like one of the things that, you know, that people are starting to see right now are what are the attack vectors? Again, um, are we going to see people calling banks and trying to imitate? Maybe, I don't know. Again, hopefully not. Uh, but the other aspect is that, you know, somebody can use social engineering and just, you know, pretend to be your, pretend to be some kind of a friend of yours and just getting information from you. Um, so it, this is going to be, this is going to be a real threat. And um, I can tell you just, just one more remark is that, you know, some of the companies, the big companies are not releasing the models and because of that aspect, but they're releasing the papers. And mm -hmm. again, like they're releasing the papers and they are open source. So people are just re replicating the papers and replicating the models. So they are uh, hard, hard to do, hard to do if they don't have uh, the massive amount of data to, to build the pre-trained models. Right. But, Yes and no, but you know, but here's the thing, like you know, some of the some of the things that again you saw that with LLMs, okay? Like sometimes you can distill the model, sometimes you can create some kind of you know replica of you know a smaller version of the model. And again, it, maybe it's not gonna be three seconds, it's gonna be seven seconds. Okay. So again, like you know, you know, we are talking about we're not talking about 30 to 60 minutes, you know, we are talking about you know some things that again, like and I'm not gonna reference that that some open sources that are replicating these type of very, very powerful models. And again, sometimes the performance is not as it mentioned in the papers, but it's not far away from there. So this is gonna be, this is gonna be a major risk. 
So one takeaway from what Yeshai just said is when, whenever available, always use two-factor authentication. Without a doubt. And, Without and a doubt. Uh, secondly, I guess, Yeshai, uh, one thing that uh, disturbs me is when you talk about detectors, uh, well, then we're back to computers, security, cybersecurity kind of realm. And there it's a cat and mouse game. And uh, defense always lags offense. So to some extent, so here's the thing. Again, you sometimes you can build some detectors that will prevent 99.9%. .9%, but again, th there is going to be a risk. Like the risks that are happening in LLMs, just you know, can generate you know, fake data and generate fake news and a lot of you know massive false content. Audio fakes are again like audio fakes are becoming real, and especially right now that you know that the amount of data that you need to replicate a person's voice is minimal. This is going to be, I think, in the foreseeable future, something that people should pay attention to. And let me close this by just uh, highlighting to our readers that earlier this year, we uh, did release a survey uh, on uh, uh, where we talked to a bunch of uh, workers at car call centers and what impact some of these speech tools may have on them. And I'll link to it uh, on this post. And uh, you'll see that actually a lot of uh, uh, workers are open to uh, uh, sp sp Speech, speech assisted technologies, uh, if you do it right. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And with that, thank you, Yashai. Thank you so much, Ben. It was a pleasure as always.